Uh, good evening and welcome to Tamworth Borough Council's Corporate Scrutiny Committee meeting on the 17th of November. Um, I'd like to remind all members that the meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube. Uh, we have apologies from Councillor Simon Goodall and uh, Councillor Richard Ford has kindly agreed to be his substitute this evening. Um, Councillor Chris Cook has submitted his apologies and Councillor Sheree People will be a few minutes late. Uh, I think that's everybody. Uh, next item, the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 6th of October are here for approval. Can I request a move and second there, please? Moved by, thank you, moved by Councillor Cook and seconded by Councillor Cooper. All those in favour? Thank you very much, that's carried. Are there any declarations of interest to declare? No, thank you. Uh, no particular update from me that's not covered elsewhere, although there is one request uh, we've had which is to move the agenda around slightly um, so if we can go with the quarterly performance report then assure and then social, ha social housing item after that anyone got any problem with that no cool thank you uh, responses to reports of the corporate scrutiny committee um, from the meeting we held on 6th of october there are two recommendations for cabinet to consider first was gun date regeneration terms of reference I presented that um, regarding the programme board membership to the 20th of October cabinet meeting um, and then they received the full report at its meeting on the 10th of November and then street market update I presented our recommendation to instigate a focus review of the market strategy as a result of the changes in business conditions um, to that meeting on the 20th of October. Has anyone got any questions or comments on that? No? Okay. Um, Six consideration matter referred to this committee. We have leaseholder charges, but we've got that covered later on in the working group, so I think we can leave that there. Forward plan. I believe we normally look at this at the end, right? Yeah. Um, so we'll look at that when we're looking at the work plan. So it takes on to quarter two, performance report, and I'll hand over to the leader of the council, Jeremy Oates, to take us through that, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, you have in front of you the quarter two performance report. You'll notice there's been a, uh, a number of changes to, to the report in its format and structure. Uh, so this is a, a new one which is a bit more refined uh, than the previous ones uh, you're used to receiving. Um, so the report is broken down into 10 sections uh, which are listed on page 15 of your papers. Uh, and they run through uh, the recovery and reset program, uh, corporate projects, uh, key projects uh, in terms of those that are red or amber. Uh, corporate pro there's then a breakdown of corporate projects by priority. And I remember last time we had some discussion as to which one, uh, which one certain ones sit in. Uh, there's the actual spend uh, charts uh, that you requested, Mr. Chairman, uh, in section five. There's an update on universal credit uh, there's an update on the corporate risk register, uh, as well as updates on the impact of welfare reform and COVID-19 on council services. Uh, and there's the end of quarter two statement on the MTFS uh, monitoring, and also there's the financial uh, health check as of the end of September. So as members will be aware, there's some changes uh, in terms of the reset and recovery since the last time this came uh, to your committee. Um, we, we referred to them last time, but due to timings, uh, they, they, it, it was work in progress and they weren't in the, in the actual report. So this is the updated position uh, since the last time you saw it and since the decisions uh, that were taken through Cabinet uh, last, um, last week. Um, so as you'll recall, due to the, the levelling up fund bid uh, being submitted, uh, we put a hold on a number of elements within the project uh, because it would be unwise to make a decision uh, without the knowledge of whether we were receiving uh, levelling up fund two support from government or not. Uh, unfortunately, the levelling up fund support uh, decision has not been forthcoming, has now been delayed to December. Uh, and those who have been around for a while will know that uh, anything that's promised in October by government generally means it's going to be December before you hear about it. <laughs> yeah, on a good day, yeah. Um, so, so we're still waiting for that. So that's. Uh, that, that's uh, just a, a further delay in terms of making decisions around some of the elements. However, 
as an update from the last time we met, um, we discussed the rationalisation of Marmion House, uh, and you'll see on the papers uh, that we're looking at uh, reducing Marmion House just to using uh, the ground floor where possible to, to reduce the cost of maintaining the, the rest of the building. Um, and for those who were at Cabinet last week, you will hear my comments that when I approached Marmion House last Thursday, there were five floors illuminated. So if, we'd least, if we could just turn the lights off on five floors, that would make a huge difference to our, uh, to our expenditure. So that's, the, that's the, the progress from the last one, is we're now looking at uh, a, a workshopping, sorry, we're workshopping the decommissioning of, of Marmion House down to, down to the ground floor. Uh, the other projects uh, are as detailed in your papers. Uh, and as we said last time, smart working was highlighted um, as, as amber last time, but it didn't state it was complete. So we've updated the reports so that states it's complete to, to remove any, any, any confusion. Uh, obviously, the customer service offer uh, is, is continually being reviewed in light of uh, the anticipated LUF uh, announcement. Um, and we've bolstered that a little bit. Uh, with the vulnerability audit that's been uh, that's taken place as, as well under under Joe Sand's uh, element of that project, uh, so those two are, are running together to to ensure that we we don't have anybody fall through the gaps. Uh, and as stated in the papers, there's also service redesign continues, uh, and there's some work around the community wardens and their role, uh, which um, went through cabinet last week uh, with some amendments in terms of uh, some aspirations around enforcement. Um, so there's a bit of detail in the report as to what's happened since the last time we met and what activities are planned uh, for, for the next reporting period, uh, and they're detailed on page 17 of your papers. Uh, moving on from that into section two, we've got the corporate project summary. Um, all of those are green and on course because they are due dates by the end of this year or, or next year, so end of 23, March 23 or March 24. You will notice that Corporation Street uh, is highlighted as amber. And if you scroll through the reports uh, to the next section, it does suggest um, that actually uh, we need to re-look re at that project. Uh, we reassessed it as part of the Eleven Up Fund and, excuse me, uh, and, uh, and the outcomes of that. If you remember, we removed it from Future High Street Fund because it didn't fit that particular criteria. Uh, whereas we're now in a situation where we have to review that whole project uh, and involve stakeholders and, and make sure that's that's fit for purpose. So, so in terms of that gateway project, uh, a full review needs to take place to ensure that we get the the, the best out of that. So that's why that's higher. Uh, that, that's why there's no progress on that at the moment. Uh, as mentioned last time, the corporate projects are listed by priority, uh, and therefore information on pages 20, 20 to twenty two. Um, 23 is your normal general fund actual spend summary, uh, which you requested a couple of years ago, Mr. Chairman. That just gives us a comparison year on year in terms of the position uh, as, as to where we're at on those. Uh, however, they are quite small uh, and some would argue difficult to see on that sheet. Um, universal credit summary, you'll notice that uh, in terms of uni universal credit, whilst there is some fluctuation, uh, it sort of follows the same pattern as we've seen since quarter three in 2020. Uh, and you'll also see that there are currently 1,671 council tenants who are in receipt of universal credit. Uh, following section covers the corporate risk register, uh, which highlights the risk and uh, causes and consequences should those risks materialise. Uh, and there's also some notes on there as to how we're monitoring that uh, and how we'll mitigate uh, issues should they should they arise. Um, the big ones really that we all all focus on uh, come a bit later on with the impact of benefit uh, reform and COVID-19 on council services. We know there's been an increase in, in demand. Uh, however, we're not seeing a huge increase in impact in terms of this section of, uh, of, of the report this year. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's not materialised as yet as, as we anticipated. And that goes along with the, uh, uh, with the, um, uh, the commentary around uh, cost of living increase. We're not yet seeing that materialise in terms of an impact on our, on our services. Uh, scrolling further down to the medium term financial strategy uh, and the monitoring of, 
uh, and you'll notice that uh, on top of page 46 of your papers uh, there's a chart there that summarizes the position of the budget uh, at February 2022 when it was approved at full council uh, and you'll see underneath there there are a couple of revised uh, stress tested for, uh, forecasts uh, and you'll notice that the best case scenario at the end of October 22 uh, is positive in comparison with the forecast from February uh, and so is the central case scenario. However, I will add that this does not include any policy proposals that are being considered as part of the budget process uh, and also uh, within that doesn't include any committee decisions that have been made since the end of that quarter and doesn't include projected increases in energy costs etc so at this stage this is on a on a like for like comparison so so the figures you've got here uh, will be different from the figures that members discussed uh, at the budget workshop uh, at the budget presentation last wednesday wednesday whatever day it was one day last week uh, so so this is a like for like comparison as opposed to, to, to keying in those policy changes uh, and those increases in energy costs. Um, so that's pretty much uh, the report in front of you. Uh, sorry, similar thing with the, uh, with the HRA. You'll see there's been a, a, a reduction in the outturn for the, for the HRA as, uh, as we pro pro project forward. Uh, so I've got nothing further to add, but happy to take any questions, Mr Chairman. Great, thank you very much for that. Just one comment. The, the graphs that you saw requested, a working group of this committee requested. Um, yeah. So, uh, have we got any questions before I ask a question from the group? Councillor Michelle Cook. Thank you, and thanks for that, Councillor Oates. Just one um, point of clarification. Um, on page three of the report, it says, Amber slash red areas program has no current amber and red areas, but then on page four it says about Corporation Street being an amber, and you did reference that. Is that correct, or does that need to be amended? And is that just needs to be amended in the report? Oh, actually, it's, um, yeah, it's page, yeah, page three. It's got the program as no. It's set by my Yes, it's. So what did you say, the Corporation Street? Um, well, yeah, so in the actual kind of, um, in item, in kind of chapter one. Yeah, but this is just reset and recovery. Yeah, but then it, so it's reset and recovery was none. Okay, that's fine. That's just what I wanted to check. That you want to come in there, okay, then. You found fine. it. If I, that, that page just refers to that element. Uh, what I've done this time, Mr Chairman, yeah. is because last time I used mod.gov and my numbers were different, this time I used the online committee papers and it appears Councillor Cooks used the method that I would have used last time. So, so I apologise for not being on the same page. Uh, but yeah, that, that just relates to that particular programme. Yeah. Okay, uh, I've got a quick question. On the current rent arrears, um, the graph, as you can see, it seems to follow the same pattern, and each year it's it's higher. The number is higher. Presumably, that's just because the rates have increased as a total, right? Um, what is it as a pr proportion of expected rent? Is it any worse than normal? Because we can't tell from that graph as a proportion of expected rent what the arrears look like as a total. Um, it seems it seems to follow the same pattern. But I wonder what it's like as a proportion. Who's it, who's it you? Yeah, do you want to, do you want to come in? I'm happy to try and offer a, a, an explanation in relation to that. So you're absolutely right. The trend in terms of current rent arrears across the council's housing stock is following the same pattern um, in terms of we'd expect that to be where we are at this time of the year. Um, however, the actual arrears are increasing. So, and that's because of all sorts of pressures around um, you know, the cost of living around people's changes in income, et cetera, and around our bad debt forecast in terms of um, 
the, the the arrangements that we've got in terms of how we calculate that. So they are increasing and we are doing some work on that in terms of how we can try and mitigate that within the context of the current challenges. So to answer your question, it is following the same pattern, so there's nothing alarming, but the rate at which it's increasing is higher than it was previous years. Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you. So that's probably one for our working group then to perhaps add it as a proportion. And I'm presuming that's in the scenarios for the budget as well, that worst in scenario. Yeah, that would be in the stress testing, yes. Thank you. Councillor Michelle Cook. Thank you. Can I just ask a follow-up on that? I mean, what's the average rent arrears for council tenants at the moment? And I'm assuming on the back of that, I know when I was put portfolio holder and got called Scrooge by the Daily Mail for writing out at Christmas, <laughs> not saying we want cancer files to be called Scrooge, but um, but actually, again, the same in terms of writing out to people to say Christmas is coming, don't pick Christmas presents over because there's been three evictions since April. One would assume if we've got, what, 16, no, 1,170 people in rent arrears, that's a significant amount at that point on yeah. bottom but yes thank you um yeah literally i think that's just something to say we don't want to be in a position that well we'd, we, we would we, we would prefer not to be in a position to evict people but we will if they continue to go in to rent arrears thanks did you want to come in there yeah, Matt, thank you um, so I think it's about unpacking that question because it's you know it is complex as you know, um, Councillor Cook. So in terms of our um, baseline position, around 55 to 60 percent of our tenants are on housing benefits, so it's covered. Um, so we're talking about those who actually pay their rent. The average um, rent arrears is between five to eight weeks, and again that's based on a range of circumstances. But as you know, we do. Um, support very much early intervention and a prevention um, arrangement. So eviction is very much the last resort. Um, and we do run a Christmas campaign to support people with our voluntary sector around that. So, um, you know, we are heavily invested in terms of the team around that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Did that answer the point about the timing of letters as well? Do you... Yeah, I think, I mean, I know the team work on it. I think it's just that point of when we're all dealing with constituents as well the message from all of us has to be <laughs> pay your rent where you can and if you can't and if you can't come and talk to the team as early as possible because they're there to help not to be a barrier thank you yep councillor Rich, you want to come in i uh, just just want to su support the very last comment that was made uh not just with housing rent but any any financial debt to the council uh, from an individual the key thing is to talk to the council. Uh, we're, we're, we might seem draconian and want the money off you, but actually we, we are concerned about your welfare as well. So, you know, you must come and speak to the council if you've got uh, a, a, a rent arrears issue or, or council tax or, or any other debt. Okay, thank you. Three people, council people. I think there might be one other, but you can come in first. Thank you. Um, I'm sure that we're working very closely with the various advice agencies in terms of making sure that people are signposted to um, appropriate help and advice. Um, and I'm sure that Tina would want to assure us that that continues to be the case. Absolutely, councillor people, you know we, you know that goes to the heart of our offer and we've got a range of partnership arrangements that you know support that early intervention approach and you know our team do very much get in at those early stages to offer that you know wider assessment and that and, and that support and as we say eviction is very much a last resort and you know we work with people we work with our benefit colleagues we work with partners um to provide that holistic uh, arrangement so yeah i can assure you of that thank you thank you i think councillor harper is next thank you very much chair um, yeah, uh, on the um, point the leader made be regarding Marmion House, um, we're obviously entering a very, very difficult period. A lot of people are going to have a, many problems, I suspect, and will need help, they will need advice. Um, the 
leader said that um, we are basically consolidating everything in Marmion House onto the ground floor. Um, can I ask if any consideration is being given to moving the front desk facilities from the assembly rooms back to Marmion House, where, um, where people will have a far more secure and better, better access to, uh, to services. In my own experience, people won't go to, the, to a theatre to talk about tax or whatever details. Can we not consider using the ground floor facilities that are already there for as long, six months, 12 months, whatever it takes, how long, however much longer Marmion House is standing there? Can we not consider using that and bringing it back into use? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first point is we should never forget that members of the public have the opportunity to book one-to-one face-to-face -to -face appointments. Uh, the, the, the reception desk itself in the assembly rooms or, or Marmion House is a first point of contact. Uh, so for those private conversations, one-to-one -one appointments have always been, been used, uh, whether it be in the interview rooms or, or uh, the arrangements we make now. So, so private one-to-ones are still available. Uh, and always has been. Um, Zoe, you're leading on customer services and, and, a, and a number of other things, I'm next, you know, not just customer services, but do you want to pick that up? Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the, the tourist information centre at, at the assembly rooms are taking those um, visitors. Um, we're monitoring the footfall, we're um, collating the data of the people that are coming in, the numbers and the reasons. Um, we have an average of 24 visits for mommy and house queries per month. So we've been doing, um, taking the data for um, 12 months now. Um, the uh, key issues that people are coming in for are council tax, um, to ask about um, balances or talk about um, moving property. But there is nothing that the team have not been able to help either by signposting to um, voluntary sector agencies for some things or actually arranging appointments with um, council officers. But everybody's been helped. Thank you. Can I, do we got a supplementary there? Yeah, it's, it's simply that in my experience and from what people tell me, um, they're not, they won't use the assembly rooms for this reason. Uh, if they're in town, um, historically, they'll just go to the, tech, the council office, not, not to a theatre. They don't regard that as the place to go. So that's possibly why uh, your figures uh, are, are rather low. Um, I can't see m too many cost implications of doing this if, if it was deemed possible. Um, is it not worth considering? Um, for the sake of making access to the council a lot easier than it currently is. Thanks. Can, can I ask, link, link to that question, do you know the difference from, you know, what's the difference, the, the queries here compared to when it was at Marmon House? Has it drastically dropped off or is it largely the same? We were having 50,000 people through the door at Marmion House a, a year and we're having 24 a month queries. Um, at the moment. Um, talking about um, reopening Mommy and House, there would be a significant cost implication because the staffing levels that we have are to um, operate the models that we're using at the moment. So to reopen a, a front facing offer somewhere else, we would need to um, <coughs> employ uh, more staff, which would have a very significant cost to the council. Thank you. Okay, and it's probably hard to to gauge because there's so many other things going on, but is there any correlation to that drop off in face to face contact and the increase in arrears? Is there any potential correlation there that you suddenly dropped one dropped off and the other went up? Is it linked? Do you want to come in? Um, it was an item of caution. While a lot of respect for what Councillor Harper said and a lot of respect for Councillor Harper, a you know, great community champion himself. The idea of reopening the doors to Miami House is absolute nonsense. We have just got the public used to the fact that Miami House is going to go. Let know, let's reopen the doors, confuse them a bit more, and then a year ago, shut them again. We cannot, as an authority, have this reputational or service breakdown like this. We've taken the decision to e-commission Miami House and we're down that line. We're 13.6 million adrift over five years. We cannot mess around like this. We cannot afford to. 
This council is facing the abyss unless we make some brave, brave, brave decisions, not just politically, not just holding the controlling group to the fire. We need to collectively, as councillors, open our eyes out. We've got significant problems as a council. And reopening the doors of Marmion out would be a fundamental disaster in so many ways, shapes and forms. We shouldn't even be discussing it. Personal opinion, Mr Chairman. Yeah, thank you. I think we've had a pretty good answer here as well on, on what, it, what it would mean. Did you want to come in there before we bring Councillor Harper back in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, as part of the Council's recovery and reset agenda, obviously this was a key project within that um, and was the basis of all the Cabinet decisions last week. Um, and in terms of the package of measures designed around limiting Marmion House to the ground floor to pave the way for its future regeneration um, and deliver the 5.1 million forecasted savings around that, you know, we, we're not able to reopen the front door of, of Marmion because that would, as, as um, Zoe has said, that would cost in excess of 675,000 over the medium term just for the staffing alone. So, so, so the view was that recognising that that customer service offer is threefold, if you like, the expectation, and I agree with Councillor Harper, the expectation was that from the assembly rooms it would only be that triage and that signposting um, in favour of a continued acceleration of our e-digital platforms. We've seen an exponential growth in digital traffic on the telephone and on the, the website. Um, but importantly, also attached to that cabinet report and what um, you know, cabinet was supportive of last week was an appendix which set out what that vulnerability offer looked like. So for those people who need face-to-face -face contact, there's a whole package of measures now around community connectivity. So whether that's through our partners in the voluntary sector, whether it's through staff doing home visits, whether it's through our staff doing surgeries in the community, there's a whole range of that now. So. I think the important thing is people haven't got to go to the assembly rooms for face-to-face -face interaction. That is just a mechanism by which to filter and signpost. Actually, if people need that support, then our staff are continuing to provide that. And that's why we're seeing low numbers, and that's why we've not seen any complaints about that service. So, you know, I would caution around reopening Marmion, because um, as has already been said, and as Cabinet have supported, that supports our wider play shaping agenda around regeneration, Councillor Harper. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Right, thank you. I think that's very clear and it's good to hear we've not had any complaints about it. May I just have a quick... Uh, yeah, quickly and then we'll move on, yeah. Thank you. Very, very quickly, yeah. Um, uh, Councillor Cook and I obviously disagree on this. Um, I think the most important thing is to provide front desk access for people who require it, people who need it, people who can't use the internet, who can't use, um, who, who are reluctant to book interviews, the, they, they need somewhere they can go and speak to someone who knows what, how they can be helped. Um, the assembly rooms, I understand, was only a very temporary um, venue for, for holding these services until somewhere else could be found. Um, I think it's very disappointing that we are not in a position to offer that service in a more suitable venue other than the box office of the Tourist Information Centre. I think for a town of Tamworth size and population, our people deserve something better than that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, can we move on then? Any other questions over this side? Uh, Councillor Danny Cook. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I've got a question of Councillor Oakes that isn't political. I, I'm asking him for an observation. Obviously, we've sat you know, as leaders of us for a long time in different periods. When I used to present to the controlling group and then to all council and the council, these wonderful figures on the budget screen that used to show 8 million adrift, 7 million adrift, 6 million adrift, was I really speaking to myself, just like I feel sometimes you are a little bit at the minute? You have literally just taken this council and all councillors to a budget that is the worst it has ever been in the history of Tamworth Borough Council. If you say this council spends on average across its four budget areas 100 million a year, over five years, you look at the hole in the two capital budgets and the general fund budget, this council is somewhere in the region of 15% adrift of the money it needs to deliver the service it has now. Never mind add to them. And then I see the list of potential growth items. 1.5 million for a summer festival in the castle grounds. £20,000 a year for a heritage festival in the Castle Ground, and I could keep going. 
and these massive growth items while this council's never been in so much financial trouble in all its life. And my question to Councillor Oates, and I used to feel it myself sometimes as leader of the, um, you know, the Conservative group, do you feel sometimes you're talking to yourself about these problems? It's just a general observation. Uh, do I feel like I'm talking to myself? Um, it, it, it's so much easier to spend money than it is to save money. Uh, and I think um, the, your observation about uh, the position of the budget that we discussed last week, uh, uh, and I'm very mindful that that's not been public yet, so, you know. Um, what I wouldn't like to do is, is, is dampen aspiration. But the bottom line is, the reality is, we can't afford to do everything we want to do. Um, and I've always said, you know, that there, there's, there's always enough money in the budget the challenge is what your priorities are, and that's the the, the, the stage we're at with the with the budget at the moment. Uh, but yes, it's um, it's often frustrating, as as you've suggested, Councillor Cook. Uh, it's often frustrating when uh, when you sit there and you've got a, a, a nice big deficit to fill, and someone comes along and goes, "I'd like to spend a million quid on this." Yeah, we can we can all spend money. It's 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 harder to to, to save money, um, uh, and I think save money is probably the wrong term. Probably. Um, redistribute uh, but yeah it's 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 it's, it's always a challenge um I, I hope i'm not talking to myself in the same way as i hope you weren't when you when you were presenting as well uh, but yeah it's uh, it, it's not an easy task okay thank you councillor people thanks chair i wanted to take the opportunity of saying something in this effectively public arena that i said in that private meeting which is that we have to be very careful as a council to deliver the services that we're obliged to deliver and make sure that we do that very well but be extremely cautious about um i was going to say fripperies which is, is, is sounds like a like, slightly flippant word but things that we're not obliged to do but that we would like to do because at the moment i don't think we've got the money to do that um and without wanting to sound political, I know everybody says oh labor all they want to do is raise taxes and spend more money actually i don't what I want to do is to try to give a, deliver the, the best value that we can to the people of Tamworth for the services that we're obliged by law to deliver to them. Yep. So that's why we've got to be really careful. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Right, so we're straying way off now um, into the future budget. Any more questions on the QPR report that's in front of us? Councillor Cook. Just a comment, Mr Chairman. I thought the font was very nice. The was very nice. Okay. Any other comments? Questions? No? So there's the usual recommendation that we endorse the report and submit our questions and comments along with it. I have a move and a seconder. Yeah, move by Danny Cook, seconded by Councillor Harper. All those in favour? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Jeremy Oates. You are free to go. Um, and thank you to the officers that prepared the report as well. Um, so we decided to move the agenda around, so we're now going to go on to the update on the Assure project. We have uh, Assistant Director for Growth and Regeneration, Anna Miller, and Assistant Director, People, Zoe Waliki. Is that how you pronounce that? Okay. You're on your own then? Okay. So, um, yeah, over to you for the update, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, councillors. So, um, a little bit of background to um, Assure. Um, it's a product which is an upgrade to our M3 Planning Environmental Health and Land Charges system, which provides back office processes to enable these service to be delivered. Assure will be completely browser-based. Um, once everything's moved over to there, it will give us um, more flexibility in terms of access and uh, for staff. And it will also support the overarching ICT strategy, which is to move to cloud-based services where um, we can. So the products um, provided by a company called NEC, which was previously called Northgate, and we're shortly going to be receiving from them a 12-month decommission notice for the M3 platform. And so, therefore, it is necessary for us to upgrade to the new um, platform. But it should be noted that in the interim, there is full um, support from um, NEC to, to um, uh, support the system and to any changes that need to be happened to it, they will um, help us with. 
So a project team has been established to deliver um, the system. Myself and Anna Miller as Assistant Director for Growth and Regen are um, heading it with heads of service from ICT, planning, environmental health and support staff from all of the teams, which also includes customer services and housing. So all those who are operationally involved in the project are awaiting training on the document production system. And this is where we've come to a little bit of a halt because there's an issue within the test system, which is um, NEC's issue, not a uh, Tamworth Borough Council's issue. And so progress has had to stop until that can be rectified. So the training was originally booked for July. Um, it was cancelled the night before it was due to happen. Um, our head of ICT is regularly chasing the account manager, but we've still not got a resolution. So until that resolution has happened in the test system, we can't progress with the project anymore. So um, they are committed to resolving it um, in the time frame that will allow us to complete the project by the end of the decommissioning period. So planning a work of a working hard on converting letter templates, um, but they can't do the final um, process moves until the training has been completed. Um, environmental health um, have two sides to the system. One is document production, so the similar issue um, they have as the planning department do. And the second side is licensing. Now, um, though some members would have um, seen the corporate portal My Tamworth yesterday um, on a session, and um, the, that can provide some of the services that we're looking for in licensing. So the team are currently assessing the options as to whether the licensing module of Assure or um, using the My Tamworth portal um, will be the best option for us to take forward the licensing um, side. Um, they're looking at what's the best fit for the organisation in terms of the cost, um, customer accessibility and alignment with the ICT strategy. So this is all about um, assisting customers to um, go self-service. Um, Assure are um, going to be demoing the public facing licensing module and Civica are going to be working with us to say show the licensing module there. So that's where the project's at. Um, work is ongoing, but we are really restricted by um, the current situation with the issue with the test system. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I've got a few questions, if I may, Mr Chairman. Uh, yeah, thank you for that, Zoe. Where would you flag it as a risk at the minute? Low, medium or high? Low at the minute because we haven't actually been issued with a decommission notice. We're doing the pre-work, knowing that that is coming, but we haven't had the notice yet. What, what, what stage would it go to medium? Um, probably when the decommission notice is received. Because obviously this question was asked of full council a couple of months ago, and the Colin Martin Summer said there was nothing to worry about. There is things to worry about, isn't there? There is. Uh, well, so what we were told that full council was incorrect. When he told Councillor Price there was nothing to worry about was incorrect, just to clarify that. I'm not asking you to answer a political question. There are things to worry about, aren't there? I, th yes. I think the decommission, when we get the decommission notice will be the, the point where yeah. we, we are escalating with, um, with NEC. Uh, with, with the account manager is escalating it now. Thank you. Obviously, quarter four performance report from last year flagged this, if you knew where to look, which obviously said, you know, environmental health had began in early 2021 to look at their aspects of the Assure system, but ran out of time or didn't have the capacity through COVID, was flagged as a risk, which eventually was what put it on the agenda for this committee, if I remember correctly, Mr Chairman. Has that work now been caught up or due to the other platform we potentially migrate to? Is it just not being completed? The environmental health team now have, um, there's, a licensing officer that's being given um, this is a project to do so the the Anna has tasked it to one of the uh, members of staff so and last question I promise obviously you said we could look to go to the other system if absolutely necessary is that a last minute bolt on or is that actually no we're actually developing um, in the meantime um, part of the taxi licensing process with the my Tamworth portal to assist um, that process so that's why we're looking, because um, my Tamworth can do elements of it. So we're looking at what's the best fit for the organisation. Last one, Mr Chairman, I promise. Uh, can we request a briefing oh, no, from the office to set out timescales of when a risk becomes a risk, at what point we are in trouble, etc.? Just a real breakdown from the office, because obviously we've said as a committee we're going to keep our eye on this until resolution. Can I request an actual written update of 
what's going on, where we are, what point it becomes a risk, when it becomes a higher risk, just so we can understand the flavour, because obviously we're not going to let this go until it's resolved. Thank you, and thank you, Zoe. Thank you. Okay, so you move that as a re recommendation, yeah? Seconder. That's a cook. Everyone happy with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I believe so. We had enough. We had enough nods. It doesn't seem unreasonable. No. Any other questions or comments? No. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So that takes us back to what was item nine social housing regulation bill preparedness uh, we have the portfolio holder for homelessness prevention and social housing councillor farrell and the assistant director for neighborhoods tina mustafa head of housing management lee birch i believe yeah and mr mick warner consultant is that right yeah okay so i'll hand over to councillor farrell please Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I won't waffle. You'll be very pleased to hear you've got a yeah, thank you. You've got a, um, a very detailed report back in front of you, um, courtesy of Tina Mustafa. So thank you. Um, just for me, before we start, this is a really important bit of corporate work for the council, um, and it, it's it's very good news. It's uh, it's our self-assessment. So we've basically looked at everything we do. Um, a very detailed report with the help of Mick, who uh, Tina will introduce in a minute. Uh, it emphasises our one council approach, it puts tenants at the heart of what we do, it's bounced around lots of different committees, it's been to the homelessness uh, subcommittee a couple of times, it came to cabinet last week, um, so it's gone through a lot of council processes Mr Chairman um, and, uh, and I'm very pleased with the report, so without further ado I'll hand over to Tina to give it in full, thank you. Thank you Chair, thank you Councillor Farrell. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to introduce uh, colleagues with me tonight who are going to support on our preparedness for our social housing regulation bill. So that's Mick Warner who's been working with us um, as part of the external self-assessment which I'm going to talk about and I'll let Mick introduce himself when we get onto the presentation in a second or so. And, and obviously Lee Birch, he's the Head of Service for Housing Management and Neighbourhood Resilience who has also been working closely in terms of the self-assessment. So the documents that you've got either in the pack or uh, online include not only copies of the scrutiny report tonight but also references to the cabinet report that was approved last week. Um, there's also copies of the improvement plan which we want to focus and spend some time on tonight um, along with the regulator's most recent guide in terms of tenant satisfaction uh, measures. So you've got the full suite of, of information there. Um, but I just want to say something about our context and the background in terms of the social housing uh, regulation bill. So if you've if you've clicked on the links, you'll see that that's making its way through the parliamentary processes, and it rep represents a fundamental shift in the way council housing is um, regulated and and, and managed. Um, it removes or is seeking to remove what we call the serious detriment test. In the past, um, unless there was a breach of the consumer standards. Um, that wouldn't have triggered a, uh, 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 an investigation by the regulator. That removal of the serious detriment will be in favour of a more proactive inspection regime starting um, probably from next year. And then there's an expectation that we will be inspected every four years across all that consumer landscape. Um, that very much shifts that to one of um, validation of all our data and all our intelligence. The uh, government have talked openly around naming and shaming of landlords. Um, you will have seen in the in the press, professional and otherwise, the, the, the forensic scrutiny on some of the worst performing landlords um, and a need to make sure that we are putting tenants at the heart of our service and delivering um, high quality council housing. So in the cabinet report last week uh, that was endorsed, it set out um, the sort of journey we've been on around the self-assessment. We believe we've been at the vanguard of this and we started our preparations for this last year and since then we've been um, to a number of our social housing um, and homelessness prevention subcommittees of which now tenants have formed part of that um, and been able to 
discuss that approach and share with them the findings. So Cabinet have um, noted and endorsed those findings and also supported the development of the improvement plan which you've got before you. Um, and the role of corporate scrutiny was recognised in terms of that. Um, so I just want to say before I hand over to Mick, because you'll be glad that you'll hear from him rather than me, um, but it is very much a one council approach. As you know, we don't have a housing department. What we have is a one council uh, ethos and a number of those council housing functions are now split right across the council. So there are um, four consumer standards covering tenant involvement and empowerment, tenancy arrangements, home standard which is basically repairs and health and safety as well as neighbourhood and community standards which covers clean and green and ASB. So all of that, you know, all of our um, assistant directors and corporate management team are going to be involved in that. So it's important at this stage that the improvement plan provides a framework by which we can monitor that. And as always, that improvement plan is dynamic. So don't worry if you forget something or you don't mention something to, tonight, um, because as we go forward, it will be kept under review. And obviously, the legislation still needs to be enacted so we're still awaiting directions from the regulator and from the government so very much we're on the front foot here so um so so yeah so i'll hand over to mick and let him introduce himself we've got a presentation to help structure the discussion but we you know we are asking that it's interactive and you do give us some feedback from the documents that you have before you thank you chair this is all very new to me. Um, thanks, Tina. Thanks, Chair. And, and thanks for you know, in, in, uh, inviting me here tonight to talk about our work, but also just for uh, yeah, the opportunity to work on this, on this assignment. And it, it, it's self-assessment. We, we've done the work um, along, you know, and, and talked to officers a lot through all the process. But it's yeah, you know, we do see ourselves as working together in all this, and it's a very very different. Well, as Tina will know, very different to if the regulator was coming in and doing that. So, I hope for all good practice. Just a just a little bit about us to begin with. Um, YD Consultants. So the YD stands for Yvonne Davis. It's Yvonne's firm, really. Her background is very much in housing, both in local authorities and in housing associations, and for a period of time led on housing inspection in the north for the audit commission uh, when it uh, existed um and Yvonne works i mean the last i guess the last 12 years or so really as a consultant a lot of her work has been around it's around housing management and compliance but it's about resident involvement and resident engagement i've worked with Yvonne for the last uh, couple of two years at the end of this month uh, and prior to that, I was at the regulator for 22 years. Uh, I did a variety of uh, jobs there, but it gives me a good understanding of the way that they operate and the way that they think and what they're what they're looking for. I think really. So, so that's our our background, uh, the assignment. So we were asked to, uh, yeah, to to, to deliver self assessment compliance with the regulators regulatory standards. Now, the regulator has consumer standards and economic standards, all providers, whether you're a housing association or a, uh, a local authority or a for-profit provider indeed, have to comply with the economic standards, uh, sorry, with the consumer standards. Um, and local authorities, only the rent standard applies of, amongst the economic standards. And obviously there's been, basically you'll see there's been some relatively good news today on that, I think with the 7% settlement on the, on the rent cap. I'm surprised it's that, that high actually so it could have been much worse i think and um, i think worth saying that you know this piece of work while we try to uh take into account what was in the social housing white paper i mean th that does need legislation as tina says that's going through uh through the parliamentary process now but i mean that and that's still just a a, a piece of legislation it has to feed through into standards that will be consulted upon uh, before we really know what the what the requirements are on on registered providers from um, from it, it, it's beginning with that white paper, I guess really. Um, I seen just done some of my thunder here, as I expected might happen. But um, yeah, I just wanted to mention the serious detriment um, test as well being swept away by the legislation and the, and the more proactive role for the regulator. They are clearly resourcing up for this. Um, and I've been saying for some time, be ready for what is to come by ensuring you're compliant with what is there now. Um, 
you will only come into the regulators' radar as a local authority if you're, you know, if you really make a mess of things. I think it's fair to say. But if you if you look, if you followed this, um, there's been a steady stream of regulatory notices over the, the last year or so. I guess slightly longer, the quite quiet period during the first year of the pandemic. But it's certainly it's certainly heated up since then. And I have to say that the vast majority of regulatory notices being published for breaches of the consumer standards and this is almost always health and safety have been for local authorities so you'll only come on their radar at the moment if that's you know and we found nothing in that area that we're of concern i should say that now um in the future all local authorities that have, have retained their housing stock will come onto the regulators radar annually i guess through their collection of data and then as tina says every four years or so through through inspection. I think you can expect that the ones who will be inspected soonest will be the ones whose data gives most cause for concern when they first first receive it. <coughs> so just our, our approach then. So initial desktop document review and, and, and follow-up documents as well, I should say. Quite often when you do a piece of work like this, you're not quite sure what you want to look at. You don't know what documents are there until you started having some initial reviews and, and, and conversations. And we had those conversations with, I don't know if there's anybody in the room tonight uh, uh, amongst the councillors, but with councillors, senior management officers and involved tenants as well. Uh, interesting, I think, you know, in, in future, I think there'll be much more emphasis on um, engagement not just with involved tenants but you know the tenant uh, tenant group more widely I think you, we can expect that to be something the regulator focuses on of course you know as ever we triangulate that information then what are we reading what are we hearing how does that all fit together share the results of that with officers and reflected feedback in 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 our work where we could do now it's difficult we don't know at the moment what the regulator will do in terms of its judgments um, going forward, at the moment, if you're a house association, you'll get a judgment for governance, you get one for viability. They don't get one for all the economic standards. There isn't a published judgment for rents. There isn't a published judgment for value for money, for example. So they could take a, a range of approaches, I think, on the consumer standards once they've got a more proactive approach. We've sort of taken a bit of a shot at this and thinking actually there might be a judgment for the consumer standards as a whole. Now, what they do on governance and viability is there's, there's four possible ratings for each of those. Uh, the top two are compliant, the bottom two are, are non-compliant. Clearly, you want to be at the top two. And we've taken that same sort of approach and used similar wording uh, to what they use on governance viability for the consumer standards. Uh, and, and that's set out in the, in the summary report. Um, so, did our work, recommended actions, uh, categorised between urgent advisory and, well, let's wait and see what comes out of the social housing white paper, I guess, really. I think Tina and her team work then to develop that into the improve, the draft improvement plan that you've got uh, in your papers tonight. So our conclusions. Um, <laughs> this is you know, it's probably not bad, this, I would say, as you say, you know, three out of the four, compliant, uh, clearly some work to do around tenant involvement and empowerment. I mean, there'd be work to do on that anyway. That is going to be a much, uh, an area of real focus, I think, for the regulator in the future anyway. And I would say, I think that probably, probably a lot of providers struggle in that area anyway. I would think if you're gonna, if you're gonna think of those four standards there, which one might most, most providers, not just local authorities, be struggling on that. It probably is around tenant involvement and empowerment. Notwithstanding the comments I've already said about, you know, the home standard of health and safety is clearly where some providers are, uh, uh, well, are non-compliant, seriously non-compliant. Uh, as I say, we didn't find anything. And we, in the home standard, yeah, okay, things you could do to, the big they talked about maintaining compliance for things you need to do. If they came and looked at again a bit later and you hadn't done those things, they'd start to think, mm, there's a bigger problem here. This organisation isn't dealing with things. So that's, I guess, is why they use that word. And that's where we have put the home standard. But, you know, we're certainly not thinking that the home standard is anywhere near non-compliance and that there are any health and safety issues. As Tina says, you know, it, this is becomes more and more... Um, 
of the focus, I think, and you know the tragic events in Rochdale recently. I mean, you know, you know, just pointing that up even more, really. So clearly, that's the substance of it that really matters the most. But but also can't get away from as an organisation the reputational risk around around all of that. Um, the regulators' notices, the housing ombudsman's uh, notices as well. They're all getting, I think, much more. Well, certainly Mr Gove was tweeting uh, when he was at the Department of Leveling Up previously when those sorts of notices were being published. And, and um, I, I hadn't read the detail, I have to say, of the idea of a sh name and shame in non, you know, poorly performing providers, but I guess that that, might, that that might continue. Clearly, you don't want to be on that sort of on that radar, do you? But uh, as things stand, current standards, we don't see any possibility of that. But once things are much more proactive and the regulators looking at you every year and in depth every four years, clearly the scope for that would be would be great. It's a bigger reputational risk. I think that's fair to say. Um, and then the next slide, and this is it is quite a small type, I know, but these are the questions and not, I think we'll go into these, Tina, yeah. uh, at the end of my presentation. But these are the questions that officers really want to try and get some feedback on. Uh, tonight. So, um, are there any gaps in the? Yeah. Yeah. It's for members to raise the questions, not the officers. With respect. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just answer that? I I, I agree with Councillor Cook, but I think the the questions there were designed to provoke discussion. Absolutely. If they if if they're not the right questions, then we're more than happy to take others. But I think it was about structuring the feedback. So. Clearly, the development of the improvement plan, we want to engage members fully in that, and particularly in scrutiny. So it was about asking whether there are gaps in that plan, if you agree with the priorities in that plan, if it's a different plan. So it wasn't intended to structure or censor our political colleagues. It wasn't intended to do that, Councillor Cook. It was about offering some prompts for the debate. But more than happy to answer different questions or to structure it in a different way. So Thank I think you, we, Chair. you know... It, it's a, it's a starting point, isn't it? But we will obviously ask what questions we want anyway as normal, so I don't think it stops us asking those questions. Danny? Cook. Yeah, if the officers want us to fill in, sorry for the terminology, please forgive this, if the officers want to fill in a survey on the post back of our discussion, I'm more than happy to do so. But to start out with the officers deriding the question of scrutiny, after, I don't think is the remit of scrutiny. In fact, if I check the legality of it, I'm pretty sure it's beyond the remit of scrutiny. Actually, it's for scrutiny to define what they want to scrutinise. The officers to, to de uh, define the beginning of the conversation, what questions should be asked and answered, I think actually takes us outside of the 2001 Local Government Act. Okay, I don't think it's preventing us from asking the questions there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, back to you, Mick. Thank you, Chair. Just one. To, to, to recap then, so I think what was agreed at Cabinet was that we wanted to fully engage corporate scrutiny in the development of the improvement plan. Happy to not ask those questions, happy to answer others, um, but I think what we're looking for is what we didn't want to do was, was produce a smart improvement plan that there wasn't then um, ownership of because clearly you know from a governance perspective the regulator will want to say that it's well led it's been managed it's been scrutinized and that is going to form part of the transparency agenda with the regulator so yes absolutely you know we don't want to stifle any debate there so happy to open it up more generally then chair thank you yeah no problem <clears throat> i think we would naturally anyway um so thank you uh, both and thank you mick for coming along um, to benefit to us tonight and to the council obviously your regulator experience and then as a consultant uh, I think you're a good find so thank you for that um, I'll start the questions then that's all right oh no go on Sheree you I didn't put my hand up obviously chair I defer to you if you want to go first that's not a problem um, my first question is actually one of methodology um, it's actually two questions I, in, on the slide that's headed our approach, it, you said that you'd had meetings with councillors, senior management officers and involved tenants. Well, I'm not going to worry about senior management and officers because I can imagine who you'd spoke to. Um, so I'd like to know which councillors you spoke to 
And then I have a question about involved tenants as well. Okay, I'm sorry, I don't have that. Can you, can you mind, please? As I said, I'm not used to it. But yeah, I'm sorry, I can provide that detail, but I don't, I don't have it with me at the moment. But yeah, happy to provide it outside the meeting. Well, uh, Chair, I'm not aware of any member of the Labour and Cooperative Group having been consulted. Well, in that case, can we have members of Cabinet rather than meetings with councillors? Because actually they're different animals, if, if, if yeah. we could, please. And I think if it was only meetings with Cabinet, then that's a bit of a shame because uh, we all have experience. We deal with, and Tina knows I raised an issue about uh, tenant involvement and perception of that involvement or lack of it. Uh, not long ago, following a meeting on, on my patch with quite a large group of tenants who were extremely unhappy about how they perceived their involvement. Um, so, which brings me to my second question. You, you said that you'd uh, consulted with involved tenants, and I presume from that you mean members of tenants' consultative committees. And I think you, you, you made the point and recognised that actually that's not really if I may say without wanting to sound confrontational, that's not really good enough because we actually need to be able to uh, interact with and consult with a very wide range of tenants and not just those proactive tenants who put themselves forward to be members of consultative committees with no disrespect to them. Just one sec. Was it in response to this? Your point, yeah, Councillor Farrell? Just to raise a point, uh, Mr Chairman, that and this has come through the homelessness subcommittee for the last year and a half, I believe. Um, and the kind of point of that committee is to kind of take the uh, cross-party approach and kind of bring that as a portfolio holder to cabinet. So that has been done, but I do get councillor people's point that um, maybe involving more councillors would be important in this. Um, but because of the makeup of the committee that, that I chair, that has been fed through to this report. Um, so just a point to make that. So it's, so it's wider than just the, the, the cabinet, essentially. Yeah, do you want to come back in there? Chair, um, I think if we're being absolutely accurate, I'm a member of that subcommittee. Um, I've not been asked directly any questions on this particular point. So whilst... Can I just clarify that I, I actually meant the, the previous version that, that the Councillor Simon people sat on. I believe that was when it started. It's quite a long approach, but I could be wrong on that. OK, yeah. Do you want to come in? Chair, thank you for your indulgence and Councillor People and Farrell for those observations. I think there's a couple of points to sort of emphasise here that has been ongoing dialogue with the um, Housing and Homelessness Subcommittee with a range of members in terms of our preparedness for this for some time. Um, but formally, in terms of the uh, self-assessment, it's absolutely true. Cabinet were engaged in that. Um, along with members of the tenant consultative group and those who were on the active database who have historically indicated that they would like to comment on it. So I agree from a methodology point of view it was a limited group and there's been some focus groups around that as well as. But I think the point to note is this is not legislation yet. It's about just doing a, an assessment against those consumer standards and their white paper in terms of what's coming and getting us to a position where we can understand where our council housing service is. It was never intended to be the final thing. I mean, I think it was just about flagging what are some of those priority areas. And I think the improvement plan, the view is that so what and what is going to be any different is much more important and the intention is that the desktop approach has been will be shared more widely with a much wider group in terms of that methodology and then we intend to have a full you know exercise con concurrent to the the legislative timetable on the improvement plan to get that engagement um, because I think the you know, it was about recognising that some of those parameters um, and some of those um, requirements are going to happen relatively quickly. So from April, we've got to submit detail on tenant satisfaction measures. Um, and we needed to be clear that if there is a legislation enacted from next year, then we at least understand where we are as an organisation. So it was a proportionate response 
to being able to deliver where we need to be. But it's by no means the end. It was a starting point to reassure you. And there's an intention to have... I mean, you'll see from the improvement plan, I don't wish to go on, but I think you will see the area of most um, concern is the tenant involvement and engagement consumer standard. And that's because the leader was quite clear at Cabinet and he said since then that he expects... Uh, you know, there to be a greater level of tenant involvement and stakeholder engagement in the development of the plan. Um, so that's the intention going forward. But to have a uh, much more detailed process would have been disproportionate in my view to the job in hand. Thank you, Chair, for your... Yeah, thank you. That was very clear. Thank you. Um, before I go to Michelle, um, quick question for, for Mick, actually. So, obviously, you were the regulator before. I can ask, did you do this with sort of a, a normal regulator sort of lens on it, or have you been harsher in a way to try and make sure we're, we're even better than other regulators? So how, how close to the regulator view have you, would you say have you, you've assessed it? Thanks, Chair. Good question. I, I mean, I, I would say I took you know, a normal regulator's approach to this. Now, it's difficult to say that really, in a, in a sense, because the regulator doesn't do this work. Uh, now, not not on the consumer standards, but I suppose it's a similar sort of approach to what the regulator takes now. Um, so, the, so on the economic standards, the equivalent of uh, of inspection would be an in depth assessment, uh, and, it, and it would be it's it's taking that sort of approach. I've done these self sort of assessments for, on economic standards for a number of housing associations. It's a similar thing. It's you know what's the expectation here, and we're just looking for the evidence that supports. Uh, compliance or or otherwise really so um, I mean you know <laughs> some people are harsher than others aren't these on these things I'm sure others might have come to a different view but yeah we think we've been proportionate and taken you know taken account of the evidence on the other hand you know there's no point in being um, soft on these things is, is, is the you know because the regulators going to come in at some stage and they will be completely objective um, on this and so I think it's important that if we were if we were finding things, you know, areas for improvement, that we that we set all of those all of those down. So yeah, I don't think it was anything where we recorded it and thinking, you know, what we're not going to put that in either. You know, it's a sort of uh, you've only got a summary report, this detailed report behind that, and I think it's it's pretty comprehensive. And and I would say it's fair, wouldn't I? But I do think it's we've taken a reasonable approach to it because we want yeah we want to, you to to support you to. You know, to be compliant when the when the time comes when the regulator visits. Okay, thank you. So I've got a supplementary to that. So uh, where we've put um, tenant involvement and empowerment standards as C three, yeah. right? It's red, so I'm assuming red is linked to the the severity. So we put it's a issues of serious regulatory concern. Can you elaborate a bit on that? So what what kind of sanction might the regulator put on Tamil Borough Council? If this was real and that scenario was there in two years' time, three years' time, what kind of sanction might they? How serious is it uh, in terms of like sanctions they could put on us? You might yes, it. Um, you know, you don't want a non-compliant judgment. I mean, it's serious. There's that sort of there's a reputational risk in, in all of this. I suspect what they were doing, and this is you know, it's all unknown to some extent because. You know, that, that regime is not in place yet, so quite how they would approach it is is not known. Um, but 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 if you think about it, you know, if I, if I think about it from the uh, current approach that they have now, um, and, and housing associations, the economic standards, you know, there are some providers that that will receive a well, it's a G three because it's it's governance three, if you like, um, and what they will do, there you know, there aren't. Beyond that, there are not real particular sanctions that they invoke, that the regulator invokes. And at that point, they will be looking to work with the provider. And I suspect it would be the same for uh, that sort of C3 judgment, if that's what they do on the consumer standards. At that point, they're looking to, um, you know, they're looking to, to work with the, with the provider, for the provider to have an action plan to return to compliance within... A reasonable um, period of time. I mean, it's different, of course, for housing associations because um, 
you know, the governing body of the local authorities elected, and that's not the case for Housing Association. So, you know, they're likely to have, let's say, more influence on the leadership going forward in that sort of organisation. But they'll want to work with, and certainly with housing associations, so long as they, they assess the willingness and the capacity of an organisation to, to work with the regulator to return to, to compliance. It's that understanding what the issues are and being willing and able to address them that they're, they're looking for. So, uh, as I say, it's difficult to know because this is, this is not being put in place yet. I would suspect that they wouldn't want to invoke further sanctions you know, unless, you know, it would have to be pretty serious, I think, really, and, and they would need to th see, I think, that the, the local authority or any other provider wasn't working with the regulator to, to improve its, its situation. Okay, thank you. Do you want to come in there before we get to the next question? Yeah. Chair, thank you. Um, ju just to add and support um, Mickey in relation to that, um, I mean, clearly, in terms of things being non compliant, the whole point of the improvement plan is to ensure that we are clear in terms of what we've got to do and we don't get to that point by the time we are inspected because obviously this is a forward look in terms of that. Just to um, sort of unpack where we are uh, non-compliant in those areas, there are three strands to that tenant involvement and empowerment standard. The first is in relation to how we engage with our tenants, so not just through tenant consultative group, but how we reach out to those hard to reach groups to make sure we're truly putting tenants at the heart of what we're doing and our policy decision making is um, you know, is is involving them and it's part of that strategic decision making. Um, so that's the first bit and that's where there's work to be done on that and there's a suggestion in the improvement plan that we engage with people like TPAS who are the national tenants voice to help us understand that because historically we've had difficulty engaging a full range of people in terms of tenant involvement activity and I know that's a commitment that many members have shared you know, around this table in different roles in the past. Um, the second bit is around complaints and feedback and compliments um, and again we are required to comply with the Housing Ombudsman Code and do a self-assessment annually. Um, we've done that self-assessment but where there is probably lack of evidence and where we need to do more work across uh, a, a, a cross with our other teams in customer services is to show how we've learnt from those complaints and the so what. So, you know, responding to complaints is important. Um, but the so what and how we respond to them and how we develop our services as a result is key and that's also a key improvement plan. The third is around actually understanding who our tenants are from a demographic point of view. So all the equality um, and protected char characteristics and being able to recognise how and where we should tailor services. And again, corporately, we need to do more around that equality duty, all of which is in there. So with the right level of resources and capacity and support you know politically and otherwise then we're looking to make real head rows into that so we're not compliant but to answer your question specifically in terms of what the regulator would do as, as mick quite rightly says that's not been laid out in statute yet but what they're saying they're going to do is that you know there will be reputational risks because information will be published in the tenant satisfaction measures so if we're not compliant and continue to be, that will be a naming and shaming if you like. Um, there will be a requirement for a performance, they're referring to it at the moment, it may change, but as a performance improvement plan. So they would expect at the very least for us to have something like this. And ultimately, if we weren't able to show progress then, you know, you've probably seen in the press in other organisations where there's government intervention and that would then put us to major reputational risk. So there is a full spectrum of, of, of intervention um, and we want to avoid, avoid this. And all I would just finish off by saying is, and Mick, you know, no doubt will support this, is we're one of very few organisations who have undertook this self-assessment and therefore this is about putting us in the best possible position, you know, and I know there'll always be questions around what we could have done better or worse or what, etc. But we are trying to move our council housing services in the right way so thank you chair thank you great thank you for that yeah there seems to be an idea of the, the kind of sanctions i think it's just good to it, it can help focus minds when you're trying to embed something new and people understand what can happen if you don't do it uh, that's that's what i was getting at councillor cook thanks for waiting thank you chair um, so can i just kind of take us back to the point about kind of meeting with councillors 
I know I've only recently joined the Homelessness Prevention Committee. Councillor Peoples just said that she wasn't kind of asked about it. Councillor Jane and Councillor Turner, you're both on the committee as well. Have you been asked to comment on this? Because Councillor Farrell saying that kind of the other councillor people, as was, that used to be on the council, the fact that <laughs> that was seven months or so ago since he stepped down, that's one seriously long time not to consult with councillors outside of the executive, ultimately. And I think that's really disingenuous to kind of come to this committee and say, and I'm not having a go at you guys, but actually from a point of saying councillors have been engaged <coughs> with, because actually it hasn't, it's been cabinet. You cannot say the previous year, so to speak, was an opinion when we're sitting here, here and now. And my other question in terms of number of tenants that were actually involved, you quite rightly referenced hard to reach tenants. So were the tenants that were consulted, I'll say only the tenant consultative committee, people that are actively engaged, um, um, yeah, and, so, and as well, the database, database. yeah, what, what is that, how many people are on it, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, I think the, the Homelessness Committee met in a different guise for some time before, and, um, and also self-assessment is just getting ready for the, the, the future. It doesn't necessarily have to involve everybody, I suppose. I'm trying. I'm answering for you here, but when I've done self-assessment of a business, you don't involve everybody. It's just to get you ready for what might come, and then other people are involved when it comes to the actual assessments. Uh, yeah, just to agree. I mean, there's nothing more I can add to what Tina and staff said earlier. But um, I was referring to the before. This has been going on for quite a while. Um, so the housing committee met um, before May. But I think with nobody actually that's currently on the committee that was on the committee then. It was just shaking around a bit. Um, so this process has been going on for a while. And and as Tina and, and Mick has referred to, I mean this this self assessment is a choice from us as a council to get ourselves prepared for what what's ahead. Um, so we're not being obliged to do this. Um, so. I think going forward, maybe we would involve more people um, at the next stage. But I think you know, it's, I think it's a good start to be honest. Thank you. Yep, John, from there. Chair, I'm, I'm conscious that we need to move on, but just to say for the record, I'm quite happy to go home and ask Councillor Dr Alderman, Simon People, I don't know if I've got that in the right order, um, whether he was consulted or not, and I think the answer will probably be no. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, I, I get. I, I don't think it changed anything, though. So it's really. You know. Councillor Danny Cook, you wanted to come in? I've got 68 questions, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm not joking, I've got 68 questions, Mr. Chairman. Do you want to finish with everybody else first? 68. Can you summarise them in less than 68? Well, let's see where we get to then. Go on then. Your mic on, please. Sorry, thank you. Uh, Councillor Farrell, how are you doing, mate? <laughs> Uh, looking at Appendix 3, the action plan, look at the top, develop a plan and target a date for completion of installation and roof work to comply with the current DHS standards. What's the problem with them? Could I suggest you uh, summarise it with the one question you've got? Because I don't know the answer to that question, but I could hand it up to Absolutely. Tina. Absolutely. Uh, there are 73 lines of similar than that in the action plan. Mm. You opened your introduction with it's a detailed report. Can we accept it's not a detailed report? Because I haven't got the answer to 78 pieces of information there. You've got in the action plan fix the rules, but you don't tell me what's wrong with them. So when you introduced it as a detailed report, can we accept it's not a very detailed report? Because actually it opens up more questions than it answers. I just want that clarification. And that probably removes 50 odd percent of my questions. I, th I think I take your point. Um, if you've got any specific questions, please do email us over, and I'm sure we'll get an answer to it. But um, I think it is fairly detailed. But if you want to go to more detail, just you know, give us give us those questions written down. I'd suggest, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, uh, I'm just going to tease Councillor Farrell one more time, then I'll get to my serious stuff, Mr. Chairman. Honestly. Um, Obviously, on the first appendix, on page six, um, at the very first part of page six, you've got one of the opportunities slash benefits is a strong, committed cabinet 
and uh, officers can ask what the matrix or the metrics was to define that we have a strong slash committed slash good leadership in this model. Can I just ask what defined that? Uh, I, I imagine that's fairly subjective as opposed to objective. Could I suggest that no officer will ever write a report that says weak cabinet, therefore it's kind of a throwaway comment. Could I get some acceptance of that? I have a committed cabinet there, right? Committed to the project. Do you want to come in? Chair, if I may, just to sort of give some context to that. The discussions with cabinet, I mean, it was an external view on that, on the basis that when they spoke to cabinet about the need for a self-assessment on the preparedness to the new regulatory framework, that they were committed to doing the self-assessment and to the improvement plan and to engaging stakeholders further in its development and implementation. What they said, and I mean Mick is happy, uh, no doubt will, will, will support this, is what they said is they were happy to receive that and were committed to making sure that that was reported through the appropriate channels. So it was strong from that point of view in that it was recognised as a priority not in terms of giving a particular performance rating to any member on Cabinet. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Just to clarify, and I think Mrs Mustafa knows this, if I get any aggressive with any of this tonight, I think Mrs, Mrs. Mustafa is aware of the 19 years I've been at this authority. She's probably in the top four or five officers I've respected most in this time. So if any point as she feels I'm going over the top, just throw something heavy at me, please, Tina. Is that all right? Uh, so, yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, just moving into the corrective action parts, uh, within the social housing white paper uh, final kpis to be with members in autumn 2022 I've, as we lose autumn in about 15 days have we got those can you just refer to that page councillor cook sorry uh, sorry it's in the corrective actions in, it's in the corrective actions on the action plan and it's with the, where the heading is on the first column i'm sorry i've not got the page number right now uh, white paper it says final kpis will be with members by autumn 2022 Chair, yes, I mean, we are required to share those. And what you've got in, in your pack tonight is a copy of the tenant satisfaction measures that the uh, regulator are requiring that we prepare, prepare for from April next year in terms of its submission. So those are the key performance indicators that will replace the current landlord performance indicators. So those are, that, those are as they stand at the moment, but... Clearly, there's some work to be done now on how we collate and submit them in the right format from, for the regulator for next year. So, yeah, apologies, that probably wasn't clear, but those are in your pack and are there, yeah. Thank you. Hi, Mr Chairman. I'll skip over a few because they're not that important, but uh, this last one for me. Obviously, on page 11, again, of the corrective actions, I think you did raise it in your introduction. Obviously, we're talking local offer, and then we go on to diversity of our tenants. You just dig into what we mean by diversity of our tenants, because if we're saying if you're the wrong age or the wrong race, we're going to shoot you and replace you, obviously, we've got a bit of concern there. Chair, happy to pick that up. As, as I was sort of referring to earlier in terms of those three strands under the tenant and engagement consumer standard, equality is one of the key cornerstones of that, and that's about recognising our obligations under the um, equality duties and, and legislation and it's around understanding our tenant base, our demographic so that we can tailor services appropriately. So it's it's not that at all, Councillor Cook. It's about, you know, recognising, you know, how we might engage and ensure everybody has, you know, the appropriate access through tailored access to service. That's what we mean. And that's a piece of work to be done corporately. There's a weakness on that at the moment. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I was gonna, I'll leave my last comment, which is going to be obviously the government shaming people for poor performance. They've obviously run out the budget for mirrors. That was Lesson 68. Any other questions, or did you manage to summarise into that? Yeah. If you, I mean, I don't think we're done with this, Mr Chairman, because I think there's a lot of background that we need to understand. Like I say, on the action plan, there's a lot on there that says we need to do. And, you know, we need to target it, we need to understand it. But we don't understand it because, it, as Councillor Farrell said, it's a detailed report if looked at from a certain point of view. If you want to dig into it, it's not. I'd actually like to know. It's, it's on the action plan for a reason. Have the tenants called it onto the action plan as part of this process of improved customer services? As our, counts, as our stock conditions surveyed? There's so many questions from this I want to ask and really dig into. But Councillor Farrell is absolutely right. 
rather than let's take up all the time this evening, if I type up my concerns, send it to the Office of the Portfolio, we, we can dig through it. And I'd like to see this come back again before it goes live at some point, personally. And it's not for me to speak for others, but I think there's so much more to dig into that you can't just do it in one meeting. This is an important piece of work. And I'm going to be honest, and I'm going to regret this at some point, I have absolute confidence that Mrs Mustafa will deliver this 99, 99.8% because she always does. But we need to question it because that's our role and make sure nothing's missed. I'm going to regret that comment, aren't I? Yeah. I think, um, sorry, I think, uh, yeah, with, with something showing us as red at this stage, we'd always want it to come back anyway, even just that one item without uh, any other concerns. Did you want to come in there? I was just going to make the point that I agree with Councillor Cook that it does need looking into, but... You know, this is almost um, a bit of housing inception here because, you know, we have scrutinised ourselves and then we've taken this to Cabinet and then taken it here to scrutinise the Cabinet decision. It's really important that we do that and we've held up a mirror to ourselves, honestly, with the help of Mick and his team to, to look into what we're doing. So you are right, it does need detailed, you know, scrutinising, but that's why we're doing it now, before the government do come knocking. So, Tina? Uh, Thank you, Chair Councillor Cook. Oh, you know, I am in full agreement, and this does represent a significant piece of work for the Council. And a lot of the activity that's described in the improvement plan or alluded to in the improvement plan will go to the heart of the Council's organisational infrastructure. Things like improving service standards, local offers, the Council's performance framework will not just have a him, an impact on the Council housing management services, but on other services. So absolutely take your point that we've got to get this right. Um, and I think listening to the feedback tonight and listening to the questions, and I equally value and respect that, I think there is more work for us to do in terms of looking at the detail that sat behind the summer report that you've had in terms of you know a wider cross party and stakeholder group um, but also then probably with tenants given that they're at the heart of this um, agreeing the best mechanism to do that in terms of the improvement plan so you know i think we'll take that away and you know with the portfolio holder we can talk about how that what that looks like before we adopt the final plan if that's okay. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Shree, people. You, you can drop the Shree now, because there's only one of me. <laughs> um, sadly. Um, we were talking earlier about, uh, obviously, budgets and money and costs. And um, I mentioned that we should be concentrating on what we, what we have to do. Well, this is clearly... If it goes through something that we have to do um, and has anybody considered cost implications um, and can you share those with us if, if you've got the even if it's just a ballpark idea and, and I was going to say as well it seems that the thing that we need to improve most is tenant engagement and involvement and that strikes me as possibly hopefully not quite so expensive as having to put in a huge budget for for repairs and so on but nonetheless there must be some cost implications thank you um, yes thank you councillor people so in the cabinet report last week subject to the budget setting process there were policy changes recommended of a hundred thousand over two years to support um the, not only the technical and project management of this, but also to put added resource into the tenant regulatory side of it. But obviously that will take its place along with the rest of the, the budget proposals that are going forward. But those are the costs around delivery of the action plan and resourcing some of the work that's in there. The, what those costs don't include is the cost to deliver some of the... Um, uh, decent homes standard improvements for example or some of the repairs improvements or some of the um, estate improvements we want, want to make the, I think the point around that is as we understand the improvement plan and we all agree what that is when we get to it then they will result in individual cost and financial implications through cabinet as we get to them but the initial cost of just delivering this piece of work I mean you can see from the improvement plan you know accepting the points around we need to understand what those improvement planning items are there's a lot to do there's a lot of red and amber on there and it's probably going to be a three-year plan 
So just to resource that and add capacity within the teams, because this is new work, you know, this isn't something that represents business as usual activity. That's going to, you know, that's why we put forward the 100,000 policy change. But clearly there will be additional costs in terms of the tangible items as listed. And we'll bring that back to the various committees over time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do you want to come back on that point? Just to also add, uh, as well as what Tina's just said, there are some freebies, for example, bringing some members of the tenant consultative group onto the housing subcommittee. That's something we've done. It, it doesn't quite go far enough. But we'd like to engage with more tenants, of course. But um, you know, just to add to what Tina said, there are some things we're trying to do you know, free of charge, but will also uh, massively help this situation. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Councillor Andy Cooper was next. Thanks, Chair. Um, can I just start by saying that um, I think this is a, a, a fantastic piece of work. Um, yeah, we, we need to tighten up some of the uh, some of the wording and some of the elements of the of the action plan, but that's fine. Um, personally, as, as somebody who professionally works in assurance, um, it's good to see um, a, a department of the council going out to get somebody to come in and, and provide some full frank uh, feedback set against um, an agreed governance standard set of standards and I've, I've been saying this for as long as i've been a councillor we need to do more of this we need to put that mirror up against ourselves and understand our gaps so personally for for, for myself i think the um, some of the issues that the tbc is facing is that um in, in certain areas it doesn't know where its gaps are and this 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 piece of work i hope genuinely rolls up and actually gets spread across other areas the 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 timeliness of this work is, is fantastic in light of the scrutiny that this sector of, of the service is going to be under after the, the news of this week can only be a, a, a good thing and it will provide benefits so um yeah thank you thank you for that yeah totally agree thank you councillor farrell just to say, I appreciate that, Councillor Cooper, and th there is no benefit gain to being told how good you are. You've got to be told what you need to improve on. So I really appreciate that comment. Thank you. OK, Councillor Cook. Danny Cook. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. I thought I was done, but a couple of points just caught. Yeah, absolutely agree with what Councillor Cooper's just said. Uh, our, our housing people have always been very good at fetching the external people told that mirror up and they're a credit to it i mean the amount of times i used to say as a cabinet member i've got to give it the, the housing departments again yeah they've got top marks again it got boring didn't it team let's be honest um, just a quick couple from me uh, mrs mustafa when was the last time you heard my hra reform rant do you want to hear it again because <laughs> this this still gets me it really really does Historically, what used to happen was, you used to have the housing subsidy system. So what you used to do is you'd go collect your sake of argument, 18 million pounds in rents in Tamworth and council houses. You'd hand it all over to the government who'd go, ah, well, Mr. Tamworth, you only need 14 million, but in reality, we'll keep that 4 million. And then places like the London boroughs, Leicester, Liverpool, and other places like that, they used to top those up. So Tamworth was always in negative. Anyway, when we went into austerity and the government books were a bit flawed in 2010 and 11, the government offered what was called HRA reform. What had basically happened is when the council houses were built in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, councils had never played, paid the government for them. They borrowed the money from the government to build them, but they never paid for them. And then another archaic piece of legislation in the 60s, the government said they'd also cover your interest. So no council had ever paid for their council houses. So the offer was made to get off the government's books. If you give us £67 million for all the council houses in Tamworth, we will set you free of the government. So we borrowed £67 million from the government that we now do actually have to pay and gave the government £67 million. To which they told us straight away afterwards, however, if you sell a house under right to buy, we keep 75%. Oh, under the Rent Restructure Act, as we've seen today, we'll tell you how you set your rents at. And now we've been told how we've got to govern them. I just want to know, did somebody tell me how they set us free for 67 million quid? Because I've still got no idea. But yeah, my quest actual question is this, after my rant I have way too often about council housing and the government failing to set us free, is uh, Miss, Mrs Mustafa again will remember, we went through the decent home standard through most of the noughties, so from around 2003 you had to meet the 2010 target. And I remember it being Liverpool and Leicester in the main who said, some point in 2009 to the government, what happens if we don't meet the target? And the government said, we'd never thought of that. Is this potentially another one of those schemes where they might shame us, but if we don't meet it, so what? 
Is it potentially one of those? They might shame us, but is there any penalties, any risks if we decide, you know, this is not for us? Just throwing it out there. Similar to my sanctions question earlier, right? What, what can they actually do? I mean, Chair, Councillor Cook, I mean, it goes to the heart of, you know, that whole sanction in, in terms of what the new regulatory um, sort of interventions are. So you're back to, we'll be required to report on what level of decency our stock is. That, that will be part of our submitted tenant satisfaction mm -hmm. measure. That will be uh, benchmarked with other providers. So there's that reputational risk is if we don't achieve it, then that's going to invite that kind of feedback. But I think there will also be um, an expectation from the housing ombudsman um, and from the regulator that we'll have a performance improvement plan and we'll have the requisite governance in place to make sure we do meet things like decent homes. Obviously, from a financial point of view, that's got to be proportionate because you know that, yeah, it's got to be proportionate in terms of cost. But yeah, so I think it's back to the same sort of sanctions. Mick, do you want to add to that? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Tina. Yeah, I mean, the regulator does have powers now that it doesn't necessarily use. I mean, it, it can it can fine now, find uh, the providers, and it, uh, to my knowledge, it's not done that. It really doesn't use many of its powers. It prefers to regulate by consensus, if you like, and clearly the powers it has over housing associations are... And we <laughs> can't make you merge with another local authority, can they? We can make a housing association merge with another. Um, I, 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 and, and you know, and you all know about how um, the relationship between central government and local government, and I, I don't. But I mean, Tina alluded earlier to action that central government might take. I mean, Liverpool have got commissioners in at the moment, haven't they, over something else? So I, you know, that might be the route that uh, central government take i suppose rather than trying to do it through the regulator that will you know will always have limited powers in respect of local authorities so that might be that might be what happens i guess okay thank you councillor farrell thank you i just want to put it to the committee that it's very important that we know what the sanctions are but as the portfolio holder for homelessness prevention and social housing um, it, to me the sanctions are irrelevant because we should be actually performing at the highest standards and shouldn't be worrying about sanctions because we should be putting you know what we do and the people first um, and not even thinking about sanctions because we won't get to that stage because we're doing all the right things we need to do giving ourselves a self-assessment and getting ourselves in the best possible place for the residents because this is the point of this it's for the the social housing residents we have in Tamworth so we need to make sure that we get into a situation where we are proud of the service we offer and this is a, a really big step in helping us get there so the sanctions is important we know what the sanctions are but in my mind that's that's irrelevant because we're making the best job we can Councillor Danny Cook yeah, absolutely agree with Councillor Farrell. Where absolutely possible, we deliver the best services we can to our tenants that deserve it. However, it comes a bigger complication than that, and it's the reason for my question. As we've heard, £100,000 over the next three years to try and deliver this, you've got a £7.5 million hole in your five-year capital budget to repair council houses. We don't really have capital in the HRA. It's all revenue contributed, if you understand the HRA budgets. What if we get to a point where fitting people's windows and gas boilers, which are essential, especially around winter, is more important than putting these new standards in place? That might be a question we have to ask ourselves. Yes, we want to deliver the best, but at the minute, you can't deliver everything you are wishing. Currently, as a cabinet member, looking at the budget proposals that you know need to go through base budget process, you can't deliver all your wish list at the minute. That is shown by a £7.5 million hole in the capital budget. So something's got to give. My question is, if it was this, what's the penalty? Because you've got to make a decision somewhere, and that's the point I'm getting to. I want the best services. I'd rather see a tenant have a gas boiler and keep them warm in winter than ticking a government box about standards. Because we know we'll tick standards as a council, because we've got great officers that will never let us fall below. If it came down to it, that's my question, that we said this is not important to the residents or the tenants of Tamworth, actually gas boilers, windows, doors, roofs, everything that's on that capital budget, which we know is all revenue generated, there is no capital in reality, there has to come a decision, and my, that's the basis of my question. So I'm throw at you, Councillor Farrell. If it comes down to it, what's the penalty if we go to government? Sorry, we just can't do this. It's not hitting our tick list. What are you going to do to us? And like, just like Liverpool and Leicester did in 2010, we've got bigger fish to fry government. What are you going to do about it? So I think you're right. I think we answered that earlier, didn't we, that we'll know more when it's actually implemented. Chair, it's just worth making the point because... 
Council Cook's absolutely right. I mean, the government have announced today that it's going to be a 7% cap, which puts us in a slightly better position than we'd anticipated because we planned for a 5% cap. So we are in a better position in terms of that. Um, but you're absolutely right. We are currently about to embark on a review of our housing revenue account business plan. And there are all going to be choices in terms of that. And, you know, talking to the portfolio holder and in terms of um, the tenant consultative group, we're looking at how we can start a, um, a consultation exercise on what those choices are. You mentioned council house finance reform. I was here in 2012 when we did that. And if you remember, we launched a prospectus at the time on what those options were for tenants and we did a full exercise in terms of that and I think through the HRA business plan there will be a proposal to cabinet coming forward on what that's going to look like because there will be some difficult choices and we can't afford to do everything that seven percent puts us in a slightly better position but it still creates a potentially just under 200 million gap over the 30 years of the life of the business plan um, so yes that is decisions will have to be made but not now I think the decisions we will want to set out what those decisions are and bring that back to cabinet on the consultation plan around that thank you Mick thanks chair yeah I sound a bit I know I sound a bit like a broken record but I, th I think a key thing here is that this the, the changes to consumer regulation and a more proactive approach to consumer regulation, you, you, local authorities have not experienced that before. And so therefore, if, if, as long as you don't do something really serious, and it's generally around health and safety, you, you know, there's no, there's no relationship. So this is establishing a whole new relationship, really, between, between the regulator and, and local authorities. So I, I think it is really difficult. I, I, I do think that probably... Um, you know, the, the regulator's powers are limited and you know, what would be the point of a regulator finding a local authority? I mean, all that does is, I'm not saying they wouldn't do it, by the way, and I'm not the regulator, but it just means you've got even less resources available to do what you, you need to do. So, it, for me, I, that seems to me to be a difficult thing for the regulator to do. I would have thought that anything government, anything that that's going to happen as a result of that sort of decision and I accept that it might have to be made I think it's likely to, to be made through government rather than through through the regulator but the, but that's you know on the basis of there isn't that existing relationship so who knows really okay thank you Councillor Andy Cooper yeah just to come back on that one with the regulator in my experience um the regulator would normally fine us but then tell us to reinvest that money elsewhere, i.e. direct, take, take the money out, but forcibly direct it into where they see the problem needs to be fixed. So that's just a quick one from my experience of dealing with regulators. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so I think we've exhausted that for tonight. That's the feeling I'm getting. Councillor Danny Cook. Uh, just obviously to move the motion that we see it again before it's finalised as a committee and obviously open offices. If I can submit some questions and anybody else after going through it. Yeah. Not not looking for them to do a massive work right now, but can we see it again before it goes live? Yeah. So just a request. I mean, I don't want to put that to the vote. If I can just make the request to the portfolio, if he says yes, I believe him. Yep. Yes. So, <laughs> so I was about to summarise and say that we, we have a meeting in February and that seems a, a decent time for it to come back here. Would you be in agreement we can add that to our work plan for February? That give time to, for any of, us, any of us to write anything in, you have time to review it and then give us a, a fuller picture back. Does that sound reasonable? Nodding heads? Yeah, everyone happy with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I can just personally thank Councillor Farrell and the officers. Um, if anybody's not spotted it, I'm trying to quit smoking this week, so if I'm coming across the boat, we'll be aggressive. I'm not being deliberate, so apologies for that. No problem. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you all for uh, attending. I think it's been helpful. And um, we'll add it to the work plan for February. Thank you very much. You're welcome to stay for the rest if you want, but if not, uh, see you soon. So that takes us on to item 11, which is working group updates. Two, we've got two working groups, QPR and the quarter performance report and the leaseholder charges communications working group. Um, I'll just highlight for the quarter performance report, I sent an email out on the, on the 9th to the, the members of that just to, as a potential way of approaching it. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a look at that and then hopefully come February we can bring something back 
back to here. Um, did we have an update to this group on lease, uh, leaseholder charges tonight? Councillor Cook. Uh, yes, uh, we uh, do. Um, I'm just waiting for a final couple of compliment, confirmations on those that are on the working group. Uh, I sent out an email Tuesday. Councillor Chris Cook has amended his part slightly. We're about to submit to the officers a uh, what I'll call raft of questions about issues that have been raised. Um, I've taken it on board to seek some legal advice first because I think at one point there is a possible question of are we questioning the integrity of an officer and there's just one section that we need to be careful of how we approach. So I've just taken a quick piece of advice on that. So I should be ready to go tomorrow if I get the final confirmations uh, that they're happy with the questions to be submitted. Happy to copy in Councillor Farrell if he wishes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Got that? Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep, that's next. So the full plan that we didn't look at earlier, because we normally look at it here, is there anything to add to our work plan? Um, let's look at that now. Has anyone got any items from the forward plan that they feel we haven't already got in our work plan? I don't. I don't think so. Anybody? No. I keep adding to it every minute, Mr. Chairman. Shall I stop? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so another to add from there. Thank you. Uh, that takes on to this corporate screening work plan and action log. Um, so December, we currently have draft asset management strategy. Uh, I've not heard that there's any risk to that not being ready. That should be ready. Okay. Then February, we've got the quarter performance report. We've got the regulation social housing uh, item again that we've just seen tonight. And I'd, I would imagine potentially some kind of update on the quarterly performance working group to get some changes in time for the end of the municipal year. Anyone got anything they want to add or comment on those two agendas? No? Anyone got any comments on the action log? We have to take it as read. Yeah? Great. So. Thank you very much. It's uh, 7.47. That concludes the business of this meeting, and I now close the meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.